Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah. All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah. This evening's presentation is the first of two lectures on the oneness of God. And in this section of the lecture, I will discuss the belief in God. Because naturally, before we can look at issues of God's oneness, we would need to have concluded that there is a God. First and foremost, we should know that the belief in God is not something isolated. It is something which is quite ancient. The anthropologists who have studied human societies all over the world have all come to the conclusion that these societies have a belief in God, with very few exceptions. So from human efforts in terms of looking at the history of the belief in God, it is as ancient as man. Of course, from an Islamic perspective, it is even more specific in the sense that with the creation of God and the first man, Adam, with the creation that God made of the first man, Adam, the belief in God was given to that first creation. But from a practical point of view, from the point of view of human research, we can say that there is, from the efforts of scientists, a, con a general conclusion that the belief in God is found throughout the earth. So much so that some scholars debated as to whether this is something intrinsic in human beings, be me being inborn, that human beings are born with this natural belief in God, or whether it is something which is acquired. The issue of what they say, and they refer to it as nature versus nurture. Of the exceptions, we can mention Buddhism in its ancient form, known as the Hinayana form of Buddhism, and Jainism. These are ancient systems which were supposed to have evolved or developed around the 6th century before the time of Christ. But even in these systems, though they don't speak about the existence of God, they do have a belief that the souls which reach, attain a certain height of spiritual development, where they become liberated from the body, that these souls take on qualities of immortality and omniscience and become objects of veneration and worship. So, though they may deny the existence of God per se, they have given the attributes of God to some aspects of the creation, some of the created beings. And when we look at the philosophers of the past, ancient philosophers, we find both Plato and Aristotle amongst famous Greek philosophers who argued logically for the existence of God. And it really wasn't until the 19th and 20th centuries after the French uh, Renaissance that you find a body of philosophers uh, proposing atheist ideas, ideas that God, in fact, did not exist. And among them, just to mention a few, uh, we had uh, Philip Mainlander, who was a German philosopher who died around 1876. And in his principal writing, The Philosophy of Redemption, he stated that the world begins with the death of God. Actually, he was the first to address the issue in this way. And all who supported his ideas became known as the death of God philosophers, and this philosophy being the philosophy of the death of God. In any case, he states that the world begins 
with the death of God. Since God is a principle of unity, shattered in the plurality of the world, and a principle of joy denied in the law of suffering which dominates the world. We also find Nietzsche, a Prussian philosopher who died about 1900. He supported this idea, proposing that God was nothing more than a projection of man's uneasy conscience, and that man was the bridge to the superman. He had this idea of a human being who became uh, beyond the Norman human being as we know him, attaining for himself ultimately some of the attributes that we normally attribute to God. Jean-Paul Sartre, a French philosophy of the 20th century, also claimed that God didn't exist because, according to him, God is a contradiction in terms. The idea of God, according to him, is a projection which man must make being what he is. From these beginnings, coupled with uh, Darwinian teachings, we find atheism, or the idea that there is no God, spreading on a scale much greater than it had ever been known in history. In fact, out of this, we found Russia and China, along with Albania tagging, tagging on, uh, holding as their state religion atheism. But though this is taught and was taught as the main uh, foundation of education with regards to man, his existence, and the universe, most people who went through this system memorized what they were told from the statements of Marx, Engels, etc., repeated these for examinations, but within themse their their themselves, they did not deny God's existence because it went against their very nature. And as such, with the crumbling of Russia, the Russian state, and Albania, and China to a certain degree, you find a huge rise in religious fervor amongst the people once again. With regards to the Quran, and atheism, what we find is that there are very few verses in the Quran which deal with disbelief in God because of the fact that there were very few who held this position. In one particular chapter of the Quran known as At-Tur, which is the 52nd chapter, we find the basic presentation or the logic present logical presentation of why the disbelief in God is illogical wherein God says am khuliqu min ghayri shay'in am humul khaliqun this is the 35th verse were they created from or by nothing or did they create themselves and in the 36th verse أَمْ خَلَقُوا السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ بَلْ لَا يُقِنُونَ Or did they create the heavens and earth? Indeed, they are uncertain. These two verses summarize the basic three arguments for the existence of things without resorting to God. The first states that the creation came into being from nothing, or by nothing itself, spontaneously. And this approach violates basic reason. If somebody were to say that on some occasion, while they were walking uh, in the park, looking at the ducks in the pond, they just saw a duck appear on the water, out of nowhere, not flying and landing or having been submerged and came out, but just appearing there on the surface of the water. No one would accept this. Why? Because it is illogical that this duck would appear from nothingness. All of our human experience 
indicates that there are causes, there are reasons. Things come from other things. They don't just come out of nothing. However, this line of argument, as obviously illogical and, and ridiculous as it is when put in simplistic terms, is a line which is being used by modern scientists, the atheists among them. We have, for example, Fred Hoyle, who advocated what was known as the steady state theory, which for some time was a rival to the Big Bang Theory. In it, in his theory, he argued that matter was constantly coming into being. And he said, this is a quote from his writings, the most obvious question to ask about continuous creation is this, where does the created material come from? It does not come from anywhere. This is his answer. Material simply appears, it is created. At one time, the various atoms composed, composing the material do not exist, and at, and, and at a later time, they do. This may seem a very strange idea. I agree that it is. But in science, it does not matter how strange an idea may seem, so long as it works. That is to say, since the idea can be expressed in a precise form, and so long as its consequences are in agreement with observation, it is acceptable. This was Hoyle's argument. Of course, when he brought out this, uh, this uh, theory, and his explanation for uh, this, uh, the existence, a number of known atheists or amongst the scholars also rejected this idea because, as they put it, this was opening the floodgates for religion because it was violating the main principle of science, namely that nothing comes out of nothing. Now, we, this idea, however, in spite of the fact that it was rejected in the case of Fred Hoyle, those who argue the Big Bang Theory, most say that the Big Bang began from a concentrated uh, point of matter. Matter was in a very concentrated form, then this initial explosion took place where it started to expand you know, throughout the universe. Most scientists, when asked where did this original concentrated portion of matter come from, they will say that is not a question of science and leave it, right? Others among them, the affirmed atheists, will say it came from nothing, like Hoyle. It just came into being. And as we said, when we look at the existence or when you look at the arguments for this, these ways of coming into existence on a simplistic level, the human intellect rejects it. So no matter how much uh, scientific jargon may be placed around it, it doesn't change the fundamental ridiculousness of this type of argument. The second basic argument is that human beings or creation created itself. This is even more ridiculous because to create something, that being or that thing which is creating must already exist. Right? If this world created itself, it means the world had to already exist before it created. And for this world to be created, it had to not exist. So you end up with a, an, an argument which is self-contradictory. So the idea of creating oneself, or the world creating itself, is one which has to be canceled from the body of arguments as being totally illogical. 
The last argument that the world was created from or by something which was already created is the line of argument which states that matter really was eternal. It had no beginning. Because if we say that this creation, we call it C for creation, C1, that it was caused or created by another creation which we call C2. And that C2 was created by another creation which was C3. And we go on infinitely. Right? This is the argument that there was no, it is it's from in, in infinity. We, we cannot, we're not going to identify a starting point. Because something which is created will need something else to create it. So if everything goes back eternally, this line of creators goes back into eternity, then what in fact we're saying is that nothing should exist. Because if creation number one cannot exist unless creation number two exists, and creation number two cannot exist unless number three exists, and then so on, then it means if we go back and we cannot find a starting point, then it means that there is no cause for our existence now. It means nothing should exist. But the reality is that things exist. Existence itself is proof of the falsehood of this line of argument. It is an ancient argument. You had amongst Greek philosophers those who argued also that the earth was eternal. Matter is eternal, the earth is eternal. It's just another expression of the same concept. But this is the most popular belief today, that it was matter, this which was always, which was eternal, which by accidental uh, bouncing into each other, the early atoms or neutrons or whatever, bouncing into each other started, you know, the process of life going. And even if we accept that matter was eternal, and we think of the accidental argument for things to come into being, which then lets us accept that molecules bouncing around eventually formed you know, bigger molecules, and these bigger molecules ended up forming the precursors of life, you know, DNA, RNA, et cetera, et cetera, eventually forming the first cell, and the first cell you know, uh, eventually developing cell walls and crawling up on the land, and you know, this whole scenario which they have of how life came about, it is, it is something which is more fantastic and more mythical than anything found in the religious books explaining how human beings and how the world got here. It is, in fact, another religion which has its own explanation of human beings, this world that we live in, why we, what we're here for. We're not here for any real purpose. This is just the evolutionary principle, you know, evolving things for the better uh, without any direction, yet having direction. And what we can say ends up being the God for those who reject God is the God of chance. The God of chance. Because when we ask these people who don't believe in God, we ask them, you know, why it is that you have a good life and other people have a bad life? You've got a good job, so and so has a bad job. They would say it was my good luck. Why did he have a bad job? Because it's his bad luck. And if you look through his whole day, from the time he or she wakes up in the morning to the time they go to bed at night, 
you will see everything happening throughout their lives as being a result of good luck and bad luck. So ultimately, their God is the God of chance. Good luck or bad luck. And in modern times, especially in the, uh, from the 50s onwards, we, have, we had another phenomenon developing amongst people who rejected the concept of God but tried to find another way to explain the way things are and to give meaning to life here. And that was the belief in the flying saucers, the UFOs. As one uh, couple of university professors, Benson Saylor and Charles Ziegler, professors of anthropology, they published a book called The Roswell Myth, which is, uh, Roswell is, the, is this uh, town in New Mexico where a flying saucer was supposed to have crashed nearby in, in, a, in 1947, and uh, supposedly the American military covered it up, and there were some little aliens, and, you know, from this, the, the myth about flying saucers developed at a, on a large scale, and you find till today, this year, last year, a number of movies, books, and things being put out about Roswell. So they said, at the core of the Roswell myth is a secular way to give the universe meaning. This myth becomes a secular way to give the universe meaning, and humanity a, re a renewed place at the head of the table. Not only are the skies populated with superhuman beings, but their visits are evidence that we are interesting. Sailor said that the Roswell myth is an effort to put enchantment back into nature after human beings had removed God from creation Nature just became blind forces. In a desire to give it meaning again, this belief in the UFOs took off and it became so much of a religion that we know last year some 50 odd members of one of the UFO cults committed suicide so that they could uh, spiritually rejoin or join up with the uh, spacecraft that was hiding behind a comet which was passing through our, our, our uh, solar system at the time. The fact of the matter, having looked at these various arguments, is that the belief in God is the logical belief. And it is the disbelief in God which is illogical. Now, with the atheist thrust in the 20th century, Belief in God became classified as irrational. This was an irrational belief. Going against reason. And it is reason, according to them, which dictates that God doesn't exist. However, if one looks at their arguments, one can only conclude that it is logical to believe in God and, in fact, illogical to disbelieve. And it is on those who disbelieve to prove. Not on us who believe to prove that God exists. It is on them, the disbelievers, to prove that God does not exist. Because it is their arguments which are in fact illogical. Logic tells us that where we see design, there is a designer. And this is the most common argument presented in the Quran, where Allah invites the creation to look at the camels, at the, the mountains, how they are set up, how they are organized, etc., to reflect that there has to be an organizer behind this. It's not going to be there and with this type of structure, etc., without there having been an organizer, that it would happen by chance, by accident. When a person walks on a beach and they see a footprint in the sand. The first thought which comes to them is not that the, 
the waves of the sea have come up onto the sand and sunken into the sand, creating the impression of a footprint. How amazing that is. No, this is not the first thought that comes to a person's mind. The first thought is that somebody walked here. The ancient Arabs used to say that camel dung indicates the camel. Meaning that when you're walking out on the desert and you come across a piece of camel dung, you don't start reflecting how this camel dung appeared here. Did it come out of the sand somehow? Some things in the sand created it? And No. You see camel dung, you assume a camel walked by. This is logic. This is reason. And if we can do that with camel dung and a footprint in the sand, the human being, who is far more complex, far more intricate, to assume that he came into being, that this world came into being by accident, is as foolish as that person standing on the desert wondering where this camel dung came from. So, the questions that does God exist or does God not exist, this question is really one raised by those who deny their very nature, deny logic, deny reason. Everything around them points to the existence of a creator. For them not to accept it is a deliberate denial of that knowledge which is within each and every human being. The reason which God has given them. They have become irrational. This is why the real question for us or for human beings is not so much is there a God or isn't there a God, but who is God? This is the big question. This is the question that has puzzled human beings over the ages. Because we said the vast majority of human beings believe there is a God. But the question is, who is that God? And we find in the various societies, various communities, tribes, nations, etc., a variety of answers as to who is God. Now the essential difference between all of these answers presented by the various religions and systems and the answer given by Islam is expressed in another question. Did God become man? Did God become his creation? Because when we look at the arguments of all of the various systems that believe in God, but have different answers as to who is God, we find that the vast majority of them all believe that God at some point in time became his creation. Either he became a man, or he became an animal, or he became some aspect of his creation, the sun, the moon, whatever. And it is really only in Islam that we find the answer is no. God did not become his creation. God is the creator, and everything besides him is his creation. He is not his creation, nor is his creation him. Those who argue that God became a man, that God became his creation, usually argue from the point that God is able to do all things. Because when we talk about God, we talk about certain attributes which we give to God. That God is eternal, is without beginning, without end. He is all-knowing, all-powerful, etc. And he is able to do all things. And this is a part of Islamic belief. It's repeated throughout the Quran in so many places. Inna Allah ala kulli shayin qadir. 
Allah is able to do all things. So those who argue that God became man and once we say that God became a man we would argue that why do you want to stop there and became a man why not say became many men or became animals etc because once you open the door that God became a man this is opening the door for God to become his creation in whatever form people choose to perceive him they argue that God is able to do all things so why couldn't he become a man now for those who take this question superficially they would find that they were forced to accept this argument yes if God is able to do all things then why couldn't he become a man but the fact is that when we say that God is able to do all things, we're not talking about things which make God less than God, make God no longer God. We're talking about, when we talk about God is able to do all things from the Islamic perspective, it means all things that are in keeping with his attributes of being God. All things which befit him as God. And excluded from this are what are called the absurdities. All of the things which would make God less than God. For example, if we say that God is without beginning, to then ask, can God be born, is an absurdity. Because we have already said that God is without beginning. So to ask, can God be born, contradicts the basic belief that one has about God. But according to the argument that God is able to do all things, one would have to say yes. He's able to do all things. Though he is without beginning, he can be born. But this is ridiculous. Similarly, we know that God, one of the attributes of God is that he's eternal, without end. And again, to ask, can God die? It's a ridiculous question. But those who want to include everything in God being able to do all things would have to accept the fact that, yes, God could die. Though inside themselves, it is illogical. It goes against reason. Similarly, to say that God became a man that God became his creation is absurd because God is the creator. God is the creator. For him to become his creation, creation is in need of a creator. So it means that God would become, his, if God became his creation, he would then be in need of a creator. He could no longer be the creator. And whoever created him, that's who God is, not him. So we see that the argument that God became a man is an illogical argument. It goes against reason. It goes against revelation. True revelation confirms that God is the creator and he is not his creation. He does not become his creation he did not become his creation, and he never will become his creation. So in summing up the presentation this evening, which addresses the oneness of God. The belief in God, we said, is logical. And it is, in fact, illogical not to believe in God. The existence of the belief in God in the vast majority of tribes around this world, no matter how primitive, so-called primitive they may be, confirms that it is something essential to human beings. It is a part of their created nature to realize and to understand this, to know that God exists. And Greek philosophers 
of the past argued from pure logic that God exists. The arguments that God doesn't exist are not only ridiculous, they also represent a small element of individuals who reject reason and have sought to propagate the idea that there is no God to perpetuate or to develop a system. This was the atheist systems known as communism and systems of the like. This was a part of their own arguments for explaining a future which they proposed, a, a mythological future where a new human being would arise out of this communist system who would be angelic. This new human being would only take from the fruit of the labor of human beings what they needed and they would work according to their ability. This was the communist man, the ideal, the dream that they had. And it was a myth. It never came into being and the communist systems have fallen apart and religion in these areas have reasserted themselves. Belief in God is logical. It is affirmed by everything we see around us. Human experience confirms that wherever there is something having a design, there was behind them or behind that thing a designer. The question, as I mentioned, is not so much as is there a God, but who is God? Was God his creation? Did God become his creation? Will his creation become God? These are the questions that Islam answers with an emphatic no. The creator God is not his creation. Everything that exists is by his will. It was created out of nothing, not by nothing, but out of nothing. God, by his command, created things from nothing. And it is an inability on the part of some human beings to fathom this act of creation, which led them to believe that this world is an extension of God. When they looked at human beings, and they saw human beings creating from things which already existed, and they said, well, okay, in the beginning was God, and then God created, then he must have created things from himself. So you have the Hindu belief that people are in different castes. The top caste, the Brahman caste, was created from God's head. The bottom caste, the Sudras, were created from God's feet. And other castes were created from different parts of his body. You know, this is their concept. But the fact is that the creation of God, when God creates, is unique and different from human creation. We create by way of manipulation. We manipulate what is already there. This table was created from wood, which was from a tree, which we didn't create. The tree was already there. We have manipulated it and made a tree from it, a, a table from it. This is how we create. But God, being unique in his characteristics, as he's unique in the sense that he has no beginning and all of his creation has a beginning, he has no end and all of his creation comes to an end, he is unique in his creation. He created things from nothing. So this basically summarizes the initial presentation concerning the oneness of God.
In the next segment, we will look in more detail as to the concept of God in Islam, God in his oneness, known as Tawheed. And we'll pause here to give you all an opportunity to raise any questions you'd like to raise. And uh, the papers, I think, are available to you. Last time we extended the talk a bit longer, and you had a much more limited time to ask questions. So hopefully this time you'll have a better opportunity. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah. The question, if God created us in the heavens and the earth, then who created God? This is a common question asked by non-believers. This relates back to the, the concept of creation having its cause in creation. That if we accept logically that there had to be a being that started the process going, that being cannot be a part of the process itself. If the process of creation, things created from other things, is traced back to a starting point, this, the one who started it could not himself be a part of that process, meaning that he was also a created being. Otherwise, you are then going to look at one before who created him. And you say, okay, he started it, but he is a part of it. Then who created him? So you're caught back into that cycle of going back eternally to an original cause. So for everything to make sense, for us to exist here, there had to be a beginning point, a beginner, and that beginner could not be a part of the process of creation himself. He could not be a created being. And this is why we say, who created God is an illogical question. Because God, for him to be the one to start the whole process going, had to be uncreated. Once you die on Judgment Day, do you get to see God? It is believed, according to the teachings of Islam, that those who enter Paradise will see God. Those who are judged evil and will be punished in Hell will not see God. Couldn't the UFOs be proof of God's existence? God states that everyone both on earth and in the sky prays to him. Well, the point is that existence has been explained to us. The beings of existence in the world has been explained to us. There is another world, parallel to ours, known as the world of the jinn, about which the Qur'an speaks, and about whom Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, gave us details. If, from the evidence of the UFO sightings, etc., there are, in fact, incidences which are not explained away. And the vast majority of what has been cited as UFO sightings, etc., 
have been shown by scientists, etc., to be false. Either mistaken sightings of weather balloons and, you know, inversions, uh, ball lightning, a variety of, of, of natural phenomena create some of these uh, sightings, so-called sightings. But if, in fact, there is an element among them which has some reality to it, then the world of the jinn is an easy enough explanation. We don't have to go to other beings beyond those that have already been identified in the Quran and the Sunnah. Why do you refer to God as He when He can't be His creation? Oh, this is a common question asked about why God is referred to in the Quran, in the Bible, Jewish scriptures as he in the male form. And um, the reality is that in the Semitic languages, everything is either male or female. It may be male and female literally, or it is male and female by convention. According to Arabic, the sun is female, the moon is male, the table, tawila, is female, the chair, kursi, is male. So in, in Arabic terminology, as well as in Hebrew, you would refer to the table as she and the chair as he. But you don't mean literally that it is a male and a female here. This is just by convention. And that being the language, meaning that there is no it, there is no term, neutral term, for things that are neither he nor she. When God revealed himself through scripture in Hebrew and Arabic, and in previous scriptures, but we can speak specifically about the Hebrew and Arabic scriptures, when he revealed himself in these scriptures, he revealed himself using the pronoun he as opposed to the pronoun she, because he, he would use either he or she. And since the order in which he had created things was such that the male would be dominant, that the male would head the family, would head societies, etc. As a general rule, I mean, of course, there are exceptions, but as a general rule, males dominate the head societies, the head families. So he chose the pronoun which indicated the, the person or the personality of greater dominance. We do not, in Islam, conceive of God as being a male. People are like sheep. Just because our predecessors so-called believed in a God, convince me with hard evidence or what hard evidence is there to prove to me that there is a God? Well, this is uh, the type of individual about whom we spoke, who I would ask instead to prove that there isn't a God. Common sense, logic, reason points to God's existence. It is not for me to prove to you that there is a God. It is for you to deny what is obvious around you, to argue that there isn't a God. How do we explain the inequities and uh, sufferings in this world? This is part of the expression of those who denied God's existence that 
since God is good, then why should there be suffering in the world? Why should there be evil? Again, this comes back to what we perceive as being evil, whether that perception is correct or whether it isn't. Our perception is limited based on our limited knowledge. We may perceive something to be evil when in fact it is good. Evil which takes place in this world, which could be classified as pure evil, not relative evil, occurs only from the beings that have free will, from human beings. Where a person intends to do evil and they commit that act of evil. Otherwise, the things around us where we see natural calamities, you know, accidents, uh, misfortunes taking place, these things we may perceive as evil, but after some time we may find in them good. At any rate, even the evil which is, per which is perpetrated by those who choose to do evil, having been given the free will by God, even for that evil to take place, it is by the permission of God. If God is not a part of his creation, does this mean that God is a spirit? From the Islamic perspective, we do not hold that God is a spirit in that the spirit is itself created. God is not a part of his creation. He is not composed of the elements of his creation. He is unique in and of himself. Is Jesus highly regarded in Islam? Yes, Jesus is regarded as a prophet of God who was born of a virgin and who performed many miracles and who was not crucified or resurrected but who was raised up by God and who would return in this world as a part of the signs of the last hour, the last times of this world and he would reaffirm the teachings which he brought which were Islam submission to one God and he would defeat the Antichrist and those who invited God's creation to the worship of the creation instead of the worship of God Is it possible that the Big Bang Theory, something coming from nothing, can correspond with Allah's statement, kun fayakun, that is, be, and it is. And this is the beginning of all things. Well, as I said, the Big Bang Theory starts with matter. It doesn't start with the creation of matter. So, it's not really related to God's command to be. For matter to come into being, yes, this is in accordance with God's command to be. The Big Bang Theory really explains the existence of, of matter in motion as it is now. It's supposed to explain it. You know, as the particles of matter expand through the universe, why stars are moving in certain directions and these type of things. This is what it tries to explain. But it doesn't really explain, you know, as the majority of scientists will 
uh, a test, it doesn't explain where that matter which was compressed in the first place came from. This is a question sort of in another direction altogether. What is the importance of the cap you're wearing on your head? And this is, uh, this is just because I said the last time we had some questions which were out there and we didn't get a chance to answer them. We'll try to put in everything this evening. Uh, is it sunnah, meaning is it from the way of the prophet? May God's peace and blessing be upon him. Opinion seems to be divided. Well, it has no special significance in Islam, meaning that the Prophet, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, was not known to wear a cap by itself, nor did he instruct his followers to wear a cap by itself. What we do know is that it was the common practice in Arabia to wear a turban on their heads, and he instructed his followers to wear a cap under their turbans to distinguish themselves from the pagans. So the wearing of a cap is not in and of itself a religious act in that we have what may be called a prayer cap like the yarmulke of the Jews where they have a cap that they wear for prayer. And unfortunately we do find some Muslims taking this cap in that same way, you know, especially places like India and Pakistan, uh, at the door of the, door of the mosque, when you first come in, there will be a pile of caps there, and people will put them on as they go in to pray, take it off as they leave. So it has become, it has taken on this kind of significance to them. But in fact, this is not correct. We have no prayer cap in Islam. However, if a person wears it as a means of distinguishing himself, you know, it's a part of, of Muslim culture to wear particular types of caps. And we do so to distinguish ourselves, to be known as Muslims. Then it is in keeping with the Islamic principle wherein the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, invited us or encouraged us to distinguish ourselves from the non-Muslims in the society in which we find ourselves. How do you explain the homology in DNA between the different species and the similarity of anatomy, for example, between humans and apes? Okay, this is a person who seems to have accepted the um, Darwinian argument that, uh, you know, similar structures indicate some kind of biological relationship. However, there is a beetle known as the rhinoceros beetle. It's a bug, right? A black bug. And it has on the front part, you know, the head, horns which look something like a rhinoceros, so they call it the rhinoceros beetle. No one in his right mind among scientists, biologists, would say that there is a relationship between this rhinoceros beetle and a rhinoceros, though there is a similarity in the shape. So the fact that God has created all of the living beings with uh, a common DNA structure with variations from it, in no way indicates that one evolved from the other. That is, that is, a, that is a theory. That is a way of explaining this similarity, which isn't 
necessarily the only way of explaining it. One could say, for those who don't accept God, that it is by chance. You, know, you want to go by chance? Okay, it's by chance that we have a similar structure as in DNA as, uh, as certain other living beings. And that by chance, we have hands with five fingers and monkeys have hands with five fingers. By chance, if you want. I mean, of course, we would say that God has created the monkeys with hands that have some similarities to ours, but the fact that they were created with this similarity does not in any way indicate that we evolved from them. Just as our rhinoceros beetle didn't evolve from the rhinoceros. When we say that God created man from clay, do we mean clay in the sense of what we find on earth? There are authentic narrations wherein the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu related that man was created from different portions of clay from different parts of the earth. And when we look in clay, we know that clay is made up of elements. The elements which make it up. Clay, and it's described as moist clay, that means clay with liquid water in it and the elements of water that are involved in it, etc. We can say that man is made up of these elements. It doesn't mean that we are balls of clay walking around today. If you pour water on us, you know, we'll dissolve. No. I mean, though we originated from these elements, in the sense that our initial creation was from it, you know, we have taken on our own form. And scientists will tell you if you take the human being and you boil him down, you know, grind up his bones and everything and separate the elements, you can put him into a number of different test tubes. You know, so much of calcium, so much of carbon, so much of hydrogen, so on. And you can list it all together. These are the elements. Of course, the factor of the spirit, this is something else. But physically speaking, the human body can be broken down into elements. And these elements, fundamentally, may be found in the earth. If we can see that the concept of one God is a logical necessity, doesn't God ever feel lonely? Is that why we were created? Well, this is not one of the explanations that was given by Revelation. I mean, human beings have come up with such uh, explanations. I know there is a forged false tradition which describes God as being a hidden treasure and he desired to be discovered. He was lonely. So he created human beings to discover him. But this is nonsense. This is not an issue of loneliness. This is a human characteristic. And as God has told us, Laysa kamithli hi shay. There is nothing like him. He doesn't suffer from the negative characteristics which we have. Loneliness is not considered to be a positive characteristic. It's a negative. It represents a weakness. That when we don't have people around us, when we're used to having people around us, we feel a loss. We feel at a loss. So we have a need and a desire to have uh, people around us. That is a weakness. God doesn't have any weaknesses. And this is why the argument that uh, some Christians use to explain why God became a man, that he wanted to know how humans felt, you know. So he became a man and suffered as they suffered, you know, to make this ultimate sacrifice. I mean, it talks about this God in this way where God didn't know. So he had to become a man to find out 
what it was like to be a man. Well, we don't accept these kinds of uh, explanations because we believe God to know all things. Nothing is hidden from him. He doesn't have to become a man to know what it is like to be a man. What do you have to say about people who believe in God but are uncertain about religion, who do not think it is necessary to pick a religion? Well, such people are fortunate in that they do have the belief in God, but that belief is incomplete. It is incomplete. Because it implies that God created this world and did not communicate to his creatures. That he just created the world and let it carry on by itself. What is the importance of belief in God? If it is, if it is not going to affect our lives, it's not going to, to be a part of a, a way of life, if it's just an idea, like the ancient Greek philosophers argued, yes, there is a God. But beyond accepting that there is a God, it had nothing to do with the rest of their lives. It is just a, a logical argument. No, such a belief, as I said, is deficient. Because if God, if there is a God, and God created us, then we have to believe that there is a purpose behind our creation. If we, on our lowly level, do things with a purpose, and we consider those who do things without a purpose as being insane, we have them treated, then to consider God as having created this world without a purpose is ludicrous. And if there is a purpose, for God to have created us for a purpose and not reveal that purpose to us, again, would be inconceivable. It would be pointless. What is the point in there being a purpose and creating us without knowing what that purpose is? If we send a child to school and we don't tell the child what they're supposed to do at school, are they going to do what they're supposed to do at school? No, they'll go and play. They will enjoy themselves. If there is no purpose defined for them, then they will be lost. And God, who we would believe is all wise, all just, all knowing, all merciful, all kind, created us for a purpose and he revealed that purpose through the prophets whom he sent to mankind down through the ages. And their message is one message, that of worshiping God alone and not worshiping his creation. In your opinion, why do human beings deny the existence of God? They deny the existence of God because they don't want to deal with the responsibility. If God created us and he created us for a purpose, then it means that there are some obligations here. There's some things we need to do. This is why it's easier to think of God as being Chance, good luck and bad luck. Because you don't have any obligation to chance. Whereas, once you think of us being a creation of God, that there is a purpose, etc., then it means that there are some things that God wants from us, some things that we will have to do. Whereas a person who doesn't want to have to deal with that whole uh, issue chooses then to deny God's existence. That is the ultimate step. Or the second step is to say, okay, I believe there's a God, but he didn't tell us what he wants from us.
If God is fair, why do bad things happen to good people? This is the same uh, idea that we discussed earlier, which is related to the issue of relative good and relative evil. In fact, Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, had informed his companions that those who suffered the most, who had the most calamities in this life were the prophets, then those most like them. That when God sees strength in a person's faith, he tests him more to build that faith. When he sees a person's faith weaker, then the tests are less. The T sign is coming again. Uh, let me see if we can, uh, if any of these are quite short. Is the will of God different to the will of man? Yes. Well, the rest of the questions are pretty long, so I guess we'll have to save them for our next session. Subhanakallahum wa bihamdika and ashadu la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.